So you have an SVT. Let's quickly go through the algorithm and see how we can treat this. The first step you need to do is you need to diagnose whether it is an SVT or not an SVT. Is it narrow? Is it fast? Is it slow? What's the rate? Are there P waves? If there's no P wave and it's fast and it's narrow, it's probably an SVT. It's also important to note that everything that is coming from above the ventricles is an SVT because SVT stands for supraventricular tachycardia. So any fast rhythm above the ventricles is actually an SVT. But when we're dealing with a tachycardia that's causing problems, then that is another conversation. We're going to assess if a patient is unstable or stable. These are really poor words because we're not talking about horses. We should be using words like shocked or not shocked. So is the patient in shock? Are they hypotensive? Do they have a decreased level of consciousness? So if they're not unstable, meaning they're not in shock, meaning they're well perfused, you can go the route of a denizine or you can go the route of a Valsalva maneuver. A important point on the Valsalva maneuver is that, you know, we have the blow on the syringe, we have the push on the neck, all these sort of things. The one that I would greatly recommend you guys look up if you haven't heard of it is called a modified Valsalva maneuver. It's like four times more effective than the regular Valsalva maneuver. And what this requires you to do is to sit semi fowlers, blow on a syringe for 10 seconds, bearing down. Once that's done, you make them lie flat and you bring their legs up. That's pretty much the modified Valsalva maneuver. I'll drop a link to the bottom to the study where they assess the effectiveness and the safety of it and it worked. So the normal Valsalva maneuver is like 17% effective. This is like 47%. I've used it multiple times. Patients are like, wow, thanks. It's really good to know how to do that because generally these are the guys who have had multiple tachycardias and they would much rather just not go to hospital and deal with, deal with it themselves. Then you have the adenosine route. So you have a stable, narrow, regular complex. So it's pretty, it's pretty safe if you're going to give it to a stable patient who has a regular heart rate that is a narrow complex. So these are the patients generally who have had it before. Um, they have no chest pain, they have no shortness of breath, and you would get, put a large IV into the arm or wherever you want, and you're going to push your six milligrams of adenosine, and you're going to give your 20 more flush. If that doesn't work, you can give 12, and then your flush. Um, some people do 6, 12, 12. Um, we just do 612 because if you're going to do 1212, you're just doing the same thing again. We're going to go to cardioversion. So if a patient is unstable or in shock or not perfused, uh, meaning like chest pain, shortness of breath, drop in consciousness, hypertension, all these sorts of things, if they have any of those being caused by a tachycardia, whether it's narrow or broad or regular, whatever the case is, that can be fixed with cardioversion. We should assess the cause of the tachycardia and see if we can fix it. So maybe they're um, dehydrated, maybe they're hypervolemic, same thing sort of. Um, maybe they're just um, hyperthermic. Uh, there could be another cause of their tachycardia. Um, I've heard stories of people being cardioverted who had just been running a marathon and now their heart rate's up and they cardioverted and cardioverted and cardioverted and actually did permanent damage to the gut's heart. So we should be very careful about who we're cardioverting. Joules for that and 200 for this. And if you summarize all those numbers, it's pretty safe to start at 100 joules for anything. And if that doesn't work, go up to 200 joules. You cover all those things. You don't need to remember them. It's really not that specific. And you don't want to have to shock twice. So let's say you shock 50, it doesn't work. Then you shock 100, you just shock the guy twice. Well, you could have just started at 100. And if you shock 100 and then 150 then 200, now you shocked him three, three times, or you could have just shocked him twice. That's pretty much summary. And then when it comes to a polymorphic VTAC, uh, you're not going to synchronize because the monitor will not be able to synchronize because it puts the synchronizing little buttons on top of every um, R wave. And that is not going to happen if you have a polymorphic, meaning different sizes, ventricular tachycardia. And that's pretty much the summary of a management of a VTAC. So you can consider sedation before you cardiovert. Um, some people might use propofol and ketamine, so like a ketophol mixture. Some people might just use some midazolam. Uh, midazolam is pretty effective because you have that retrograde or anterior grade amnesia, uh, and so they kind of forget what happens. But obviously, if they're crashing, hypotensive, in shock, you're not going to give them anything that's going to affect their blood pressure. And just fixing the um, 
just fixing the tachycardia quickly is actually the best thing. I spoke to a guy who I cardioverted and he said that it's very painful, but he said that by the time you realize that it's sore, it's not sore anymore. Um, so it doesn't actually cause like permanent like pain. It's not a prolonged pain. It's just a like an instant of pain and it's gone. So that's really good to know. I think it makes me feel a bit better. Hope you guys enjoyed this. If you did, like, subscribe if you want to. If you want to keep watching these sort of things, I try and make a video every Monday sometimes. I do my best to get out one, one every Monday, but sometimes I'm just really busy in life. And So guys, hope you guys are well and thanks for watching. Bye for now.